Um, this is the public aspect of a, of a two-day scholarly program here at the law school on the question of, of political theology, um, sponsored also by, by our two centers. Um, but really, um, uh, the project is, is, owes a lot to um, my colleague Suzanne Stone, uh, who runs the Jewish Law program here. Um, and is, is uh, responsible for so many of the intellectually most interesting things that happen at, at Cardozo. Um, the reality, of course, is that programs like this, both the public piece and, and the all-day piece, don't happen because Suzanne or I think it would be kind of fun and we can think of some interesting people. They happen because other folks do actually all the, all the hard, serious work of organizing and renting rooms and making sure the speakers are, the, the microphones are here and doing travel arrangements and flyers and a million other things. And I, and I do just want to thank three people who've put a lot of work into, into this event. Uh, most of all, Ari Mermelstein. Um, and in addition, uh, Shira Billet and Ut Steyer, all of whom work for the, for the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization, uh, three very talented and dedicated people, and, and we're very grateful for all their, for all their efforts. Um, we're here tonight to talk about American exceptionalism and political theology. Um, <clears throat> Ameri the, the, the first term uh, familiar uh, in concept, familiar to all. The second, somewhat more obscure, though maybe not to this audience and certainly not to these panelists. Um, the American idea of American exceptionalism is this long-standing belief that there is something very special about this country uh, that is qualitatively different from other countries. Um, this is usually, uh, though not necessarily, not merely a descriptive statement, but a normative one. That is the claim that the, the United States um, is special in a good way, right? worthy of emulation and respect. The particular details depend a little on, on whether um, American exceptionalism is being celebrated, as it almost always is within this country, or criticized, as it often is abroad, um, and who is doing the celebrating or the criticizing. Uh, but there are recurrent themes of individualism and skepticism about the government and a belief in very robust negative rights and suspicion about positive rights um, and uh, often a dose of free market uh, ideology thrown in and, and other, other things as well. Um, it is important for American politicians to believe in American exceptionalism. Um, President Obama got in a good deal of trouble uh, six months ago when he said that he believed in American exceptionalism, long pause, then something to the effect of just like a British person would believe in British exceptionalism or a Greek believes in Greek exceptionalism, uh, which was exactly the wrong thing to say if you believe in American exceptionalism, um, unless you at least say, but you know, our exceptionalism is really exceptional, uh, which, which he failed to say, unfortunately, pol politically. Um, the, uh, We'll hear more from the people who really know what they're talking about, uh, so I don't want to go too, on too long, but, but it seems to me that there are sort of two, if you will, founding texts of American exceptionalism. Um, one is de Tocqueville, um, to whom the phrase is often attributed, um, and who in Democracy Amer in America spoke about, about American exceptionalism. Um, I would say that the, the actual place in Democracy in America where he does so or the term, or usually cited, um, has very little to do with modern understandings of American exceptionalism, and it, it's, it's about actually, uh, the chapter summary is, quote, the example of the Americans does not prove that a democratic people can have no aptitude and no taste for science, literature, or art, because his conclusion was the United States did have no aptitude or taste for science, literature, or art. It produced no great scientists, no great poets, no great artists. And the, and the claim was, but don't worry, that's not inherent in democracy. There's something exceptional about the United States that there's such a dud in this regard. Um, so that, that should give one a little pause of, about, about celebrating American exceptionalism. Um, but the, the, the Tocqueville also, uh, apart from just that quote, obviously thought there was something unique and important um, about the United States and its commitment to equality and individualism. Uh, the second founding text, if you will, I think is from John Winthrop, um, who in 1630 famously described the society that he was and his friends uh, and were about to create as a city upon a hill. Um, 
a phrase which has echoed through the centuries, which um, has been used by many politicians, none more effectively than Ronald Reagan, for whom it was a shining city upon the hill. Um, not a term that John Winthrop himself used, but actually quite appropriate in that what Winthrop was referencing, and presumably all his hearers would have known he was referencing it, uh, was the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. Let your light shine, so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Um, so when Ronald Reagan spoke about a shining city on a hill, he was taking literally the Sermon on the Mount lamp metaphor and, 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 and expressing it. Um, these are two very different ideas, right? The de Tocqueville discussion is quite secular. It's sort of a sociologist um, observing certain phenomena relatively neutrally. Um, the Winthrop proposition is extremely religious, um, resting on, on a biblical New Testament text. And tonight's panel, in a way, is really exploring whether these are, in fact, two separate strands, whether we can keep these strands separate, whether, in fact, they are uh, inextricably intermingled, whether one dominates, um, if, if not, whether one dominates, um, uh, w and, and the way, in particular, that, that um, religious concepts, religious ideologies have contributed to or shaped ideas of American exceptionalism. Um, the phrase political theology, um, which is something that all of our panelists have, have grappled with in, the, in their scholarly work, um, is a term associated with Carl Schmitt, and it, and it captures the idea that modern political ideas tend to be um, secularized version of versions of traditional religious ones. And so American exceptionalism may perhaps be no more than that. Um, with that, I'm going to, uh, to introduce our first panelist. I, th I think what I'll do is, um, rather than giving the um, impressive details of each panelist's biography all at once now before they speak, I'll, I'll introduce each panelist before, before he stands up. Um, uh, it will be a he. One of the things that these uh, panelists have in common, I should say, <laughs> I mean, you may think that it's that they're all white men, and I guess that turns out to be true. I don't know how that happened, but they all, uh, the more important point is they all have both JDs and PhDs. So that's, that's the unifying theme here. So I'll tell you as they stand up where their JD and their PhD came from. Um, the, our, our first speaker is going to be Paul Kahn. Uh, Paul Kahn is the Robert Winner Professor of Law and the Humanities and Director of the <laughs> Orville Schell Center for Human Rights at the Yale Law School. He's been at Yale since 1985. His PhD and his JD are both from Yale. Um, he clerked for, for Byron White of the U.S. Supreme Court, practiced law in Washington for a few years before joining the Yale faculty. He's the author of, of half a dozen books, many articles. The most recent book is, is called Sacred Violence, Terror, Torture, and Sovereignty. And his current book project is, in fact, uh, precisely on tonight's topic. So, Professor Kahn. So first, thank you for having me. Um, happy to be back in Cardoza. So what, what sort of political phenomena is the United States? Arguably the first modern nation state, it seems increasingly anachronistic. Long committed to the rule of law is now known for lawlessness. A leader in the move toward globalization, it often looks unilateralist. Some of this was accentuated by the last administration, but it would be a mistake to think the Bush administration simply an aberration. There has never been a jurisprudence of international human rights in American courts. We are still fighting the war on terror, although I think we're not supposed to use those words anymore. Um, <clears throat> and our skepticism about international institutions remains deep. Americans have long been unilateralists in the use of force. On human rights, the story is no different. The United States only started to accept human rights conventions when it discovered the power of attaching reservations to its instruments of ratification. Those reservations are intended to deny the, deny the treaties any domestic legal effect. Uh, the United States' commitment to international human rights law goes exactly this far. We agree to abide by the conventions just to the extent that they coincide 
with that which is already required by domestic law. They're like this. The political and legal phenomena we confront here are elements of American exceptionalism. This can hardly find its ground in justice when the whole point is to reject a neutral point of view. The claim that the rules that apply to the rest of the world do not apply to the United States is not a conclusion we can reach behind a Rawlsian veil of ignorance. It's not a claim to which others can or should be sympathetic. Lack of sympathy is one thing. Failure to understand is another. American exceptionalism, many think, is simply the expression of self-interest by an imperial power. Others respond that it's really not in our self-interest at all, and that's the tenor of much of the debate. Is it or isn't it? Whether or not it is, focusing on self-interest will not take us to the heart of the matter. American exceptionalism predates our new and likely short-lived status as a hyperpower. It, <clears throat> if neither justice nor interest to explain American exceptionalism, then what does? America is not just a political project. It's a political theological project. That religion is an important aspect of American life is hardly, hardly a startling proposition. America begins with communities of Christian exiles. It's not an accident that the American Revolution was framed by the First and Second Great Awakenings. Christian movements were prime movers in the 19th and earliest 20, early 20th century politics from abolition to prohibition. It was long a commonplace to describe America as a Christian nation right up to the beginning of the 20th century. No other country in the West so easily accepts the deep penetration of religious faith into its political rhetoric, in God we trust. Population surveys of American church attendance and religious beliefs always astound the modern cosmopolitan. Still, these numbers and these expressions of faith lead us in the wrong direction if we, re we react by thinking that Christian influence is simply that of a particularly powerful interest group. There may be such influence, but to focus on it is to misunderstand the point of a political theological inquiry. That point has little to do with the large number of Americans who happen to be Christians but rather with the way in which the Christian imagination provides the deep structure of American political belief. If the purpose of American governance were simply to solve coordination problems among individuals, then justice would be the appropriate measure of our political life. However, we do not believe in America because it, it's a means to some other good. It is itself a source of meaning that can displace all others. Indeed, Americans may have a poorly developed social welfare state because to them, politics is first of all a project of transcendent meaning. If the object of our inquiry is not justice, but meaning, then the form of inquiry must shift from political theory to political theology. Modern political theory begins with the idea of contract, the social contract. The American political imagination begins with sacrifice. The community arises out of and is sustained by sacrifice. The most famous line of American political rhetoric of the latter half of the 20th century was Kennedy's uh, line, ask not, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. He asked this of a new generation of Americans, a generation that had already fought two wars and was deep into the Cold War with its reciprocal threats of mutual assured destruction. 100 years earlier, Lincoln had set out the same proposition to his generation. The Gettysburg Address, the ground norm of all American political rhetoric, invokes the theme of national, national resurrection through citizen sacrifice, that from these honored dead, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Lincoln speaks to the same sacrificial theme expressed in the conclusion of the Declaration of Independence with its mutual pledge of lives, fortune, and honor. Already as a young man, Lincoln had identified the unique character of the American political theological project. When he called for a reverence for the Constitution and laws, to step into the fading place of the scarred body of the revolutionary soldier who literally carried the stigmata of his faith, Lincoln himself becomes the iconic figure of sacrifice linking law to death. This appeal to sacrifice is not just anachronistic political rhetoric. Rather, it remains the framing narrative of American political identity. When the World Trade Towers are attacked on 9-11, the thousands of deaths are not seen as victims of mass murder. Rather, their deaths are the latest iteration of the relationship that every citizen bears to the popular sovereign. That sovereign can always demand a life. Citizenship is never free of a possible <coughs> test of faith. Sacred violence, not individual well-being, bears the meaning of the state. 
We hear and we want to honor the rhetoric of ultimate sacrifice. From these honored dead, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Still today, under this vision of national rebirth, terrible violence is accomplished. This time the violence is directed outward, but why not? For America brings the good news that through sacrifice comes freedom. A nation founded in sacrifice is one that is willing to kill. Indeed, this is a familiar paradox. For the sake of love, we are willing to destroy. If we ask how the political theological project differs from the theological, I would locate the difference exactly here. Both locate meaning and sacrifice, but the locus of political sacrifice is always the reciprocal violence of killing and being killed. The willingness to die creates the license to kill, a principle actually formalized in the combatants privileged in humanitarian law. The Christian idea of sacrifice without threatening violence in return represents the end of the political. Political killing establishes borders. Christian sacrifice creates a boundless church, a borderless church. America cannot conceive of itself as a colonizing power, for it understands power as a consequence of its willingness to sacrifice. The United States has been at war, or preparing for war, for more than half of its existence, including virtually all of the last 100 years. For half of that time, the threat of nuclear annihilation of everyone and everything has been a constant. We have lived our ordinary lives in the shadow of the demand for universal sacrifice. Political identity could always displace every other conception of the self, and the political can always become a matter of life and death. Even when we criticize our latest war in Iraq, misguided as it may have been, we hear again the theme that at least part of the problem was in the administration's failure to ask for, for sacrifice from all. Regardless of the demographics who, who, of who actually joins the military, a subject of great interest these days, today's war on terror is imagined within the framework of political sacrifice. The new battlefield is imagined as literally everywhere and thus, as literally anywhere and thus everywhere. The result is that anyone can be called upon to sacrifice and to kill. The paradigmatic moment in this new national endeavor of sacrifice for national rebirth is not so much the destruction of the World Trade Towers, but rather United Flight 93, brought down by its own passengers in a sacrificial act of killing and being killed. In this new era, every citizen can be conscripted at every moment. Conscription, in fact, has moved beyond the capacity of law to regulate. Instead, conscription now characterizes a post-legal condition of political sacrifice. This sacrificial tradition is often seen through the lens of Republican political theory, citizen soldiers displaying the military virtues of honor and courage in the pursuit of civic fame. This line of thought gives us the well-worn battle between liberalism and republicanism in accounts of American exceptionalism. Neither gets to the heart of the matter. Closer to the mark is Carl Schmitt's concept of the exception. However, in America, the exception is inflected through an idea of the popular sovereign. At that point, exception becomes exceptional as in American exceptionalism. At stake in the politics of sacrifice is participation in the mystical corpus that is the sovereign, a giving up of the self and a living in and through the transcendent being that is the popular sovereign. Popular sovereignty in the United States is distinctly not a conception of self-government through elections that express the majority will as it emerges from, the co from constantly shifting coalitions. Political theory may give us such a process view of popular sovereignty, but to pursue this path is like thinking that we can understand religious faith by examining church attendance statistics. The popular sovereign is a trans-temporal, omnipresent, omniscient, plural subject. It is invisible to those outside of its presence, just as other forms of the sacred are invisible to those outside of the faith. It is a reified object of an experience of faith sustained through an imagination of sacrifice. That is the national narrative, endlessly repeated in film, books, classrooms, and political rhetoric. As with any appearance of the sacred, there is a convergence of the is and the ought. America, America is always striving to be that which it already is, to live up to its own ultimate meaning as the expression of the popular sovereign. The history of the nation is a double narrative of sacred presence and falling away a political life of salvation and sin. This is the political theological meaning of judicial review, which asks whether some product of our mundane political process is a showing forth of the truth of ourselves, 
or is it only a false appearance? The court's role is to recall us to the moment of rupture that was our self-creation. Whenever the popular sovereign appears, it is miraculous. It exists outside of the ordinary course and concerns of everyday life. Accordingly, its appearance is always marked by violence, for the character of the infinite is to displace the finite. Order returns only as the nation takes up the burden of interpreting the remnants of sovereign presence that have been left behind. Those remnants are the higher law of American political life. The rule of law in American life is constitutionalism founded in an originary act of violence, the mystical presence of the popular sovereign. Realization of the American popular sovereign takes two forms then, sacrifice and law. In sacrifice, the sovereign is experienced as unmediated presence. In law, that presence is mediated through symbol and ritual. The relationship here is of identity to representation. Both, both are necessary elements of the political imaginary. I want to emphasize both. Uh, revolution must be followed by constitution. Constitution must be grounded in revolution. You can't have one without the other. We are to see through representations of law to the popular sovereign whose law it is. Without that, the law might be just, but it would not be ours. Mediating between identity and representation, and mediating between identity and representation is interpretation. Here we find the origin of that form, of the form and intensity of our legal debates, which look so irrational to outsiders. Irrational because they are not really about justice. Rather, they are about the possibility of realizing a free and meaningful self through law. In speaking of political sacrifice, I'm not appealing to metaphor. Sacrifice is a giving up of a finite set of concerns located immediately in the well-being of the body. Through the act of making present a transcendent value, through the act of making present a transcendent value, this normative experience of surplusage which destroys the finite by making present the infinite is constitutive of the national community. This is the lived meaning of the state as a political theological project in which national existence is not just one end among others. Rather, it is that for which everything else can be destroyed and that which has a claim upon everything else. The American nation wants only to be itself without end. It is, for example, not a step on a path to a cosmopolitan order. Successive immigrant groups have taken ownership of the national narrative by taking up this project of self-sacrifice. In this way, they do too become part of the popular sovereign. Historically, citizenship in the United States is dependent upon a perceived capacity to bear the material presence of the popular sovereign. Conversely, groups that were perceived as unable to bear that burden have not been particularly welcomed. This is not a calculation of justice, but neither does it mean that our capacity to perceive sameness is somehow frozen independently of our understanding of justice. We want our law to be just. We want it to be just precisely because it is our law. The sacrificial character of American political experience is largely invisible to outsiders. The connection of sacrifice to popular sovereignty frames the internal imagination, not the external perception of power. That someone is sacrificing himself in the act of threatening violence does not change the appearance of the act to the victim. Internally, however, the popular sovereign exists only as long and just so far as citizens experience the truth of the self through the act of sacrifice. If they come to view sacrifice as a demand to be measured by any metric outside of itself, whether of future benefits or of justice, then popular sovereignty as a conception of the sacred will have ceased. We may still vote, but the nation has become a means to ends that voters bring to the political process from outside perhaps commercial, perhaps familial, perhaps charitable and global. At that point, the political theological project no longer makes any sense. Were the sovereign to show itself only in the form of sacrifice, then the nation would be in that eschatological moment that passes from theological speculation to the actual threat of a thermonuclear exchange. We should not forget this possibility at the border of the American political imagination. Yet most of the time, access to the popular sovereign is mediated through the rituals and representations of law. The starting point for understanding American rule of law is the idea that law gains its authority not from justice, not from the justice of its demands, but from the will of the sovereign. This is an old idea in jurisprudence, but it is experienced as a literal truth in America. The authority of the judge derives directly from his or her claim 
to articulate the meaning of texts that are themselves remnants of popular sovereignty. Judges do not rule us by means of a claim to legal expertise. Instead, they model for us an idea of sacrificial citizenship. They give themselves up to the law. This is the meaning of that peculiar rite of passage that is the confirmation hearing. At the end of this process, the justice is reborn, and emptied of all but the Constitution. There's recently been a striking convergence among Western countries with respect to jurisprudential methodology. Courts work from a specified list of human rights, those rights necessary for a free and democratic order, put forth in numerous overlapping conventions. The judge's work is to continue the, pro the deliberative process of reason. He or she considers how best to actualize a right in the particular context in which other interests and other rights must be given their due. The methodology is sometimes called proportionality review and sometimes called balancing. It's thought to have the objectivity of scientific inquiry. Thus, there's nothing disturbing about looking to foreign courts for guidance or locating decisions in transnational courts. This is a big, big debate we've been having. Reason knows no boundaries of place or time. Judges are experts, and rights are the domain of their expertise. American constitutionalism simply does not fit this global pattern. Not because the content of the American law of rights, civil rights, is substantially different from international human rights. Indeed, one paradox of American exceptionalism arises out of this subst substantive convergence. If so little is at stake substantively, why is this pattern of judicial reasoning such an emotionally charged issue in American politics? Indeed, this pattern is not seen as a model of law at all, but of judicial illegitimacy in at least three dimensions. First, the rule of law is not the product of scientific expertise. Second, judges enjoy no deference as experts, for there is no such thing as political expertise, and our law must always be held accountable to our politics. Third, if there is neither legal science nor political expertise, then a claim to be applying reason is either an assertion of false consciousness or an act of bad faith. What is it, then, that American judges do? If they are not applying reason to discern the progressive path of rights in particular contexts, they are interpreting a text. Their authority comes not from the application of universal reason and certainly not from the appeal to an all-things-considered judgment of reasonableness. All of our debates over legal rights are hermeneutical. We argue over the appropriate interpretation, uh, inter uh, appro inter appropriate interpretive attitude to bring to that text. To the uninitiated, our textualism looks very odd. Why, they ask, do we care so deeply about a text produced over 200 years ago by an unrepresentative group of privileged white males? To be bound by such a text denies the premise of liberal political theory, which understands political order as a continuous project of reform under the guidance of reason and pursuit of individual well-being. Where the possibility <coughs> Where is the possibility of progress in a legal culture that fetishizes an archaic text? Well, my description already suggests an answer. To speak of the hermeneutics of an archaic text is to look in exactly the right direction. The authority of the American constitutional text comes neither from claims of democratic legitimacy nor from claims of justice. The founding fathers did not belong to a golden age of scientific insight. They were slaveholders, failing on the moral front, they were wealthy white males, failing on the political representation front. None of this matters, because the text they produced is not a text that they authored. Rather, the authority of the constitutional text derives from its ap appearance as an act of popular sovereignty. The text is the remnant, the evidence of sovereign presence. The judicial role has to be seen as a form of ritual, to bring ordinary life into contact with the remnants of sacred presence. The privilege of judging comes from the belief that the source of public meaning in our lives comes from that relationship. Thus, there is no aspect of American life to which we cannot address the question, is it constitutional? We do so all the time. We are bound by what judges say because through their voice, we are to hear again the voice of the now withdrawn popular sovereign. If we fail to hear that voice, we will not understand why we should listen at all. American legal theorists are constantly trying to explain how the counter-majoritarian project of judicial review can be legitimate in a democratic system. But this question fails to recognize the structure of the American political imagination. Of American constitutionalism, we can say with St. Anselm, I believe in order to understand. 
The Constitution binds because it is the product of the popular sovereignty, of the popular sovereign. It continues to bind as long as faith in the popular sovereign survives. Many Americans continue to live in a sacred space in which the infinite announces its presence by the displacement of the finite, in which the legitimacy of law is rooted in ritual, and in which the outside world is seen simultaneously as threat and mission. We oscillate between missionary zeal and isolationism. We cannot exactly export our law because it is quite literally ours. But we cannot believe that other states do not have an equal capacity for an authentic act of self-creation through popular sovereignty. We cannot, we cannot help but believe that they want to be like us. Of course, I have drawn my distinction sharply in order to emphasize the different worldviews at stake and to try to pierce some of the misapprehensions of American political practice. You may think that this is merely apologetics for a political culture that is today driven by the twin sources of Hollywood, standing for unending individual consumption, and the military-industrial complex standing for a rapacious foreign policy. No one can deny the presence of these forces any more than one can deny that people of religious faith also pursue their desires and their interests. Religion is as much about doubt and sin as faith and virtue. You may also be wondering about the claims of science and reason. We are not a nation of creationists fighting against the insights of modern science. We don't reject reason, but neither can we say that science has convinced us that religious faith is simply false belief. Neither in science nor in interest will we find the fundamental structure of the American political imagination. A contemporary political theology makes no metaphysical claims about the nature of the sacred. It is a study of the, its object of study is the imagination and the world of meaning created and sustained by our collective imaginary. The United States, I have, I have argued, is a political theological project in which the critical terms are popular sovereignty as mystical corpus, sacrifice as self-transcendence, and law as a representation of the absent sovereign. This account would be entirely incomplete without making the obvious point that I am describing a community of love. Such a community has an acute sense of its boundaries, both spatial and temporal. America is a constant test to itself. Will it fail in the faith that sustains the community? That test today comes not just from the attractions of consumption and the sins of power, but equally from the rise of a global demand for justice. Reason no less than interest poses a threat to love. American exceptionalism is the exceptionalism constitutive of every community of love. I cannot tell anyone whether they should abandon justice for love or love for justice. This is what it means to say that values are incommensurable. I can say that love, like every other form of faith, is tenuous. When faith fails, we find that which we did for love seems to us now only injustice. Exactly this makes the state so dangerous. What seemed to be sacrifice can suddenly appear to be murder. Yet justice without love is not likely to strike many people as adequate, for we seek meanings that promise to transcend, not just to order our finite lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I don't know what to make about the pot shots at unrepresentative groups of white men, though, but other than that. Um, wealthy white men. I guess you spet said wealthy white men. That's yeah. um, We'll hear next from Peter Berkowitz. Um, Peter is the Tad and Diane Taub Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Uh, he is there. He chairs the Task Force on National Security and Law and co-chairs the Task Force on the Virtues of a Free Society. Um, his JD and his PhD, in this case in political science, are also both from Yale. Um, and before going to Ho the Hoover Institute um, institution, he taught both at George Mason Law School and in the uh, government department at Harvard University. Um, he is the co-founder of the and, and director of the Israel Program on Constitutional Government. He has served as senior consultant to the President's Council on Bioethics. He's a member of the Policy Advisory Board at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. And Peter Berkowitz's scholarship uh, focuses on the interplay of law, ethics, and politics uh, in modern society. So, Peter. Thank you. Um, like Paul, I want to thank uh, Suzanne Stone and Michael and, uh, and Cardozo Law School for the opportunity to come here. Um, 
I want to also want to say before I begin, um, I'm confident that there are um, ways in which uh, I disagree with uh, Paul's paper, and I'm uh, confident there are some ways in which I agree. Um, but which which ways are which? I'm not exactly sure. We'll leave it to the commentators to uh, sort that out. One can speak of American exceptionalism in several senses. For many, Amer for many, American exceptionalism refers to the history of opinions, mainly American opinions, about what makes America special. From this point of view, the study of American ex exceptionalism concentrates on American perceptions concerning American exceptionalism. But I want to focus on another sense of American exceptionalism, actually the more obvious and fundamental sense. Rather than dwell on people's perceptions, I want to concentrate on the reality of American exceptionalism. Actually, to a claim that uh, America is exceptional is not a particularly exceptional claim. There's a claim. There's a long tradition stretching back to the first paragraph of The Federalist, perhaps all the way uh, to John Winthrop, celebrating it and elaborating it. But claims about the reality of American exceptionalism actually are, are not uh, particularly common or popular in the university world. There, here, it's much more common to dwell up on America's defects, pathologies, and sins, uh, which I don't want to deny, at least in general. But it's a mistake to allow them to overshadow what is exceptional about America. Specifically, liberal democracy in America represents an exceptional embodiment of a universal principle that lies at the heart of liberal modernity. It's the simple principle and great principle that all men and women are by nature free and equal. This principle has roots that extend back to the biblical teaching that all men and women are created in God's image, and its impact extends outward, undergirding the international order that America has taken the lead in sustaining. I hasten to add, to say that America is an exceptional political embodiment of the idea of human freedom is in no way to suggest that America represents freedom's exclusive or authoritative embodiment. There is a variety of ways to be human, and there is a variety of social and political ways to embody the principle of human freedom. So implies the American experiment. Now, this idea of individual freedom that America exceptionally embodies is not, is not merely a secularization of a religious concept, as our Carl Schmitt asserts in political theology, all important political concepts. The significance of, relig of religion to American exceptionalism runs deeper. The beliefs about individual freedom embodied in America not only derive from religious sources, they also are, as T Charles Taylor has suggested, in sources of the South and the secular age, um, they also derive sustenance from religious sources. And as Taylor has also argued, cut off from their religious sources, our convictions about individual freedom may not be able to thrive or even survive. Now, despite Americans' manifest exceptionalness, American exceptionalism, actually, has increasingly become a contested concept. Today, the notion is even in some quarters regarded as, as inherently disreputable, a transparent mask for bigotry and, and exploitation. Of course, America, uh, Americans have always subjected America to harsh criticism. During the ratification debates of 1787 and 1788, some opponents re rejected the proposed Constitution on the, on the grounds that it ga gave, great, gave sanction to a great evil, slavery. For the same reason, 19th century abolitionists denounced the Constitution under which the nation had lived for more than half a century as a pact with the, the devil. In the 20th century, there's been no shortage of voices, sometimes from the right, sometimes from the left, sometimes from both sides at the same time, proclaiming that America was corrupt and decadent and headed to hell in a handbag. Intellectuals, one of whose professional deformations is to be critical to a fault, have naturally taken the lead in exposing America's weaknesses, pathologies, and sins, real and imagined. And in the previous decade, they've taken this criticism to a new level. One example, in 2003, Reflecting the conventional wisdom then at the university, student members of the Oxford Union debated the proposition that America was the greatest threat to world peace. The proposition was narrowly defeated by a few votes out of a hundreds cast. Indeed, during the Bush years, the idea of American exceptionalism gained, gained new life through a kind of perverse inversion. America was exceptional, was argued, inasmuch as it was among the family of nations 
uniquely immoral and destructive. Um, now, in April 2009, for again to that uh, press conference, the NATO press conference that President Obama gave, um, the President weighed in on the question of American exceptionalism, and he did begin equivocally. I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believed in Greek exceptionalism. This could easily be taken, uh, as Michael took it, for the view that America is not exceptional but ordinary because, like all other countries, it believes it's special. The deflationary implication was certainly of a piece with other apologies the President had offered. But, though the journalists, both in praise and blame, tended not to report this, at the, at the NATO conference, President Obama actually went on, and he actually did emphasize the positive. He went on to say immediately that whatever other people believe about their countries or about America, American exceptionalism is exceptional. The President emphasized his pride in his country, and he spoke of America's sacrifices in blood and treasure to restore and preserve freedom in Europe. He spoke of the U.S.'s, I quote him, unmatched military capability, its creation of quote, large, of the largest economy in the world, and it's another quote, core set of values that are enshrined in our Constitution, in our body of law, in our democratic practices, in our belief in free speech and equality that, though imperfect, are exceptional. So that's well said, and perhaps is as far as the President reasonably could be expected to go while meeting with other heads of state at a NATO conference to find opportunities for cooperation. And yet, the President would have been speaking empirically verifiable truths if he had gone further. For all its flaws, the U.S. is the freest, most diverse, most tolerant, most prosperous, and most militarily powerful nation state the world has ever seen. And today, as it has been for a century, America is indispensable to maintaining the international system that underwrites freedom and prosperity around the world. Why? Undoubtedly, there are many causes. No explanation would be adequate that neglected America's favorable location, protected on the east and to the east and the west by great oceans, and for, a, for over a century bordered on the north and the south by peaceful neighbors. America's abundance of waterways, vast expanses of rich topsoil, and loads of varied natural resources. And its religious heritage, which predisposed it to, provide, to prize individual freedom, equality before the law, toleration, pluralism, civic association, private property, hard work, and the spirit of innovation. And no explanation of American exceptionalism would be adequate that did, not, that did not assign a place of prominence to the American Constitution because of the moral principles that it embodies and the form of government it brought into being and preserves. And here I want to continue the argument by means of a book that was published last year called The Citizen's Constitution an annotated guide. This is a book written by uh, veteran journalist Seth Lipsky. And then he provides a kind of uh, loving tribute to the American Constitution based upon his uh, 40 years as a newspaper man. And he shares his wonder at the Constitution's centrality to the great issues of the day. This is what he writes in the preface. It's hard to think of a moment in which the bedrock of the American Constitution has glinted so brightly as it does today. He's writing in spring 2009. A new American president lofted to office on a campaign for change has acceded in a time of war and economic crisis. Our courts and our newspaper columns are crackling with the question of habeas corpus. The premier of a communist superpower, China, is calling for America to stand behind its debt obligations, even as a new administration prepares to borrow on an unprecedented scale. The states are wrestling with whether to permit the laws of marriage to comprise same-sex unions. Technology is making it possible for our privacy to be invaded in ways undreamed of in the past. And the government is taking over our biggest banks and controlling our car companies. Every one of these issues and countless more will be worked out with reference to a parchment of fewer than 8,000 words written, for the most part, 10 generations ago. Lipsky's admiration for the Constitution is conviction of its surpassing relevance he says, developed over 40 years in which the Constitution came up every day in every editorial meeting. It left, he, sa he says, it left me astonished at the scale and range of problems that can be, and so often are, reasoned out against the clauses of our nat national law, whether it be a boat owner in Pennsylvania seeking the right to oyster in the beds of New Jersey, a 
foreign diplomat in Ohio trying to prevent his American wife from winning a divorce, or retired security guard wanting to keep a pistol at his home, to name but a few of the situations in which ordinary individuals sought to solve a problem by turning to a law written by giants long before they were born. So much as Lipsky admires the founders, the American founders, great American statesmen throughout American history, and the justices of the United States Supreme Court, what he's abo above all impressed with are citizens, ordinary citizens, citizens and their contributions to American constitutionalism. In contrast to law professors, who tend to concentrate on the technical analytical prowess, or lack thereof, displayed by Supreme Court opinions, Lipsky calls attention to the citizens who bring the cases. He writes, ordinary Americans continue to turn to the Constitution, loyalty to which, more than anything else, race, religion, natural origin, language, defines what it means to be an American. This has led me to the view, he writes, that the real heroes of constitu constitutional law are the citizens themselves, the litigants, who put their faith in the courts and the Constitution and often devote their life savings to the contest. Foremost among Lipsky's, Lipsky's heroes is Clarence Earl Gideon. Poor, homeless, adamant that he was innocent, Gideon was convicted in the early 60s of breaking into a pool room in Panama City, Florida. In his jail cell, he studied the law, and he penned an appeal to the United States Supreme Court. He did, not a lawyer, arguing that a trial, he had been denied his constitutional right to counsel. Based on the imprisoned man's appeal, the Supreme Court remarkably decided to hear the case. And eventually, in Gideon v. Wainwright, 1963, the court agreed with him. Time, Lipsky says, has not diminished the significance he attaches to Gideon's accomplishment, which is also the Constitution's accomplishment. The astounding thing is that the, this vagrant accomplished by dint of having at some point either read the Constitution or heard some mortal's idea of the fantastic things it says does not cease to amaze me, says Lipsky. Now, this Constitution, this citizen's Constitution, above all, is devoted to establishing a political order that secures liberty. It does this by enumerating, separating, limiting, and mixing government powers. Indeed, the Constitution is a marvel of checking, balancing, and last but not least, blending powers. Now, this constitutional imperative to check, balance, and blend, will and reason, passion and principle, interest and necessity, this stems from two things. It stems from the political exigencies of weaving a nation together out of 13 diverse states. It also stems from philosophical conclusions arising from reflections on man's mixed nature. Above all, the Constitution seeks to balance and blend freedom and order so that order is just and so that freedom is protected equally for all. Because it recognizes the mutual dependence of freedom and order, the Constitution displays a progressive push and contains <coughs> excuse me, a conservative imperative. It's a Constitution under which America has, for more than two centuries, steadily expanded the meaning of individual freedom and enlarge the range of individuals possessing the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. In short, America's exceptional constitution constitutes in significant measure American exceptionalism. But where did this concept of individual freedom to which the constitution is devoted, of which it's a political embodiment, where did this conception of freedom come from? Well, individual freedom has a history, or it has a freedom at least according to Hegel, on whom I'm about to rely. The core of freedom is making choices and living in accordance with them. So understood, freedom is not a modern invention. Men and women have always dreamed of it, but, they've always, but they have not always understood freedom as a human right, as a great good that all human beings should enjoy by virtue of their shared humanity, as a vital element of human dignity. It was in the 19th century that Hegel famously argued that our understanding of freedom developed in three stages. In the first, the despotisms of ancient antiquity won, the despot was free. And the despot treasured his freedom. To preserve it, he, he ruthlessly subjected all others to his will. At the high point of classical Greece and democratic Athens, a few were free. These fortunate few, the citizens, took pride in the freedom, 
and they put it to good, even grand use. Athenians produced enduring achievements in literature, the arts, politics, and philosophy. But citizens constituted a minority of the city, and the few citizens generally felt no inconsistency between their precious freedom and the second-class status or servitude of the many on whose labor their freedom depended. According to Hegel, to compress a lot, it's only with the spread of the biblical teaching that all men and women are created in God's image that the beautiful idea takes root. All human beings are free, and therefore, in a most important respect, equal, equal in the, in the inherent freedom we share. In the fullness of time, philosophers restated the teaching that all men and women are created in God's image in secular terms and developed new political forms to respect it. The universal claims of this third, and Hegel believed, final stage in freedom's history resounded in 1776 in America's Declaration of Independence and in 1789 in France's Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. So you could say that, like Carl Schmitt, Hegel sees at the heart of liberal democracy a secularized religious concept. But they differ over what the master concept is. For Schmidt, the master secularized concept is sovereignty, which he contended involves a decision made in an exceptional moment beyond which there's no political appeal. In contrast, for Hegel, our decisive inheritance from biblical faith, the freedom and the dignity of the individual, imposes limits on the exercise of political power and discretion, even in the exceptional or emergency moment. Now, were Hegel alive today, perhaps he'd find in the 20th century a fourth stage in freedom's history. In December 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. With it, the nations of the world proclaimed their responsibility to make individual freedom a reality. Alas, the 20th century also witnessed the rise of totalitarianism, monstrous regimes that use modern technology to exercise unprecedented powers to conquer, to enslave minds and hearts, and to kill. Indeed, it was in the immediate aftermath of the staggering carnage of World War II and the special horrors of the Holocaust, that the nations of the world affirmed their joint responsibility to protect individual freedom, even as the nations of the world, uh, as Paul pointed out, differ on the means. There's cause to take pride in the 20th century. In it, more people enjoyed greater freedom than ever before. There's also cause for sorrow. The 20th century was also humanity's most bloodthirsty century. Nor were the Nazis the most prodigious killers. That infamous distinction goes to communism. By 1948, the year the nations ratified the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Soviet communism had already murdered tens of millions of Soviets. Millions more would die at its hands. The People's Republic of China had already, in 1948, killed millions of Chinese. Tens of millions of more Chinese were still to perish under the government's savage pursuit of revolutionary reform. Fortunately, in the great struggle of the 20th century, the liberal democracies prevailed over the t totalitarian dictatorships. And the United States played the decisive role, both in World War II and the Cold War. The United States' indispensableness in establishing an international order based on freedom is another aspect of American exceptionalism. Here I'm going to rely on uh, another book, in this case, uh, God in Gold, which is written by Council on Foreign Relations fellow uh, Walter Russell Mead, because in it he provides a masterful account of America's exceptionalness in world affairs. America's ability to project military force to all parts of the world to expand the international economic order and integrate it, its commercial life with nations around the globe, and to disseminate its moral principles and popular culture far and wide, according to Mead, greatly surpasses anything the world's ever seen. But Mead also makes a grander claim about American exceptionalism in world affairs. With due appreciation for the folly, hypocrisy, and injustices that have accompanied America's exercise of power, he concludes that on balance, the world order that America has taken the lead in making, in order based on individual freedom and human equality, has actually, all things considered, served humanity's interests because it's well suited to human nature. American exceptionalism in this regard, however, did not burst forth suddenly onto the international stage from the new world in the late 18th century. America power and American order are outgrowths of British power and British order. The American-based international system is an expansion 
of the British-based international system. And similarly, notwithstanding the many abuses committed under its watch, the British system was also nourished by a fundamental commitment to individual liberty, and through its operation, uh, Britain also spread liberty around the globe. Such a claim is bound to arouse accusations of arrogance, triumphalism, nationalism. Indeed, Anglophobia, Anglophobia and anti-Americanism actually are nothing new. While Britain and America have a long history of perceiving themselves as bringers of liberty and prosperity, they also have a long history of being perceived around the world as crude, silly, sanctimonious, self-deluded, and very dangerous. Under their outward uh, congeniality, it has been repeatedly charged like greed and cruelty. And commercial and political schemes sure to prove disastrous to those who cooperate or get caught up in them. To be sure, such accusations have in part been provoked by Britain's and America's own misconduct. But often the antith and it has to be said, the antipathy, the Anglophobia, the anti-Americanism, uh, same could be said for much anti-Americanism Americanism today, flows from envy of and resentment for, for their preeminence and prosperity. Anti-Americanism, in other words, is anything but a recent malignity. It wasn't caused by the Bush administration and won't be cured by the Obama uh, administration. Taking the long view, Meade shows that what has over the centuries seemed to Americans as a high-minded idealism and looked to much of the rest of the world like a conniving realism is actually neither, or rather it partakes of both. American conduct on the world stage is better understood as an astonishing, astonishingly successful blending of idealistic commitment to principle and realistic assessment of natural, national interest, a blending that often advances the latter national interest by honoring the former high principle. The global reach of the maritime order that uh, America has created uh, also had a strategic element, security policy and military doctrine, and the consolidation of this global maritime order also involved additional factors. It, it involved profound innovations in the world of finance. And in politics, perhaps the most important political factor was Britain's inclination, even as it created a colonial empire that encompassed the globe to permit the emergence of self-government in its colonies. Ultimately, this led to independence, first and violently at the end of the 18th century, among 13 upstart colonies on the eastern seaboard of this country. But then, peacefully, colonies became uh, self-governing independent states, peacefully in Canada, 1867, Australia, 1901, New Zealand, 1907, then Pakistan, 1947, also India that year, Singapore 1965, Hong Kong, which became part of the People's Republic of China in uh, 1997, but still maintains a high degree of autonomy. This gift for nurturing nations to independence and bringing them into the international system is crucial to a distinction, Mead proposes, between empire, which is based on conquest, and an order which is grounded in freedom and equality. As a world power, the, uni the United States has taken this gift to a new level. It ended the Second World War by bringing its enemies to their knees. Yet instead of seeking to create its own colonial empire, America followed the pattern that Britain established. America not only contributed decisively to transforming Germany and Japan into democracies, but also supported independence drives in former colonies around the world, and then invited the new states to enter the global economic system that the, U that the United States was rebuilding. The drawback of empire has always been that you had to conquer countries first and then keep them down. The advantage of an order is that over the long run, people choose to belong. Like Britain's before it, America's inclination to encourage self-government for others certainly derives from calculations of long-term economic benefit. America stood to profit from a world of open trade and free markets, but the disposition to self-government, to encourage self-government, did not flow only from calculations of self-interest. 
It flowed also from the universal political principles of freedom and equality embodied in American constitutional government. Trade routes, financial markets, and diplomatic relations that resulted were, among other things, a happy byproduct of a, adhering to American ideals and the pursuit of American interests. Now, this commitment to self-government at home and abroad reflects America's open society, a closed society, the type that dominated in the pre-modern world and retains potent appeal today, it gives priority to tradition, custom, and the claims of entrenched authority. It satisfies the powerful human desires for regularity, stability, and community. In contrast, an open society, one built around freedom, provides opportunities to satisfy other powerful human desires, those desires to develop, learn, experiment, and create. But an open society can also maintain space for traditional beliefs and practices. And here's uh, Mead's key claim. Underlying America's open society was a dynamic form of Christianity. It encouraged people to find new meaning in old practices and beliefs, thereby energizing progress while respecting tradition. Following Weber, Mead further argues that Protestant Christianity gave religious sanction to the achievement of prosperity and the improvement of society, whereas almost all religions venerate the past and aim for some form of transcendence of earthly concerns Protestant Christianity made cultivating the, tempor the temporal world through the exercise of human reason and disciplined initiative a religious imperative. Early on, it taught that success in commercial life was a sign of salvation. In the progressive era, particularly through the social gospel movement, it broadened its message to include the call to reform society by caring for the poor, the sick, and the elderly. And following the logic of its universal claims, it extended the demand for social justice to, to include the promotion of human rights and humanitarian intervention abroad. All the while, Americans supposed that history was on their nation's side, powered by God's providence. Many, of course, were inclined to think, of this, think that that providence works as an invisible hand through which the pursuit of private interest promotes the public good. Of course, secular grounds are available to justify all of this, disciplined work, aggressive social reform, universal human rights advocacy. But at his, mo at his most daring, Mead contends that it was not the secular reasons but the religious spirit which preached a checking, balancing, and blending of reason, revelation, and tradition. A religious spirit that was absorbed and disseminated by the culture and thereby molded the nation's character. In conclusion, I want to leave with a question or two. That was the country's origins both regarding uh, constitutional government and abroad. Although religion, as Paul indicated, remains strong in America, at least compared with other advanced industrial liberal democracies, social and political life, of course, have undergone substantial changes, substantial secularization since the 18th century. The question arises, can freedom stand on its own two secular feet? To answer that question, it would, it would be necessary to explore the virtues the, excellence of my, the excellences of, um, of mind and character that sustain liberty and democracy. It would also be necessary to study the variety of sources, beliefs, practices, and institutions that sustain those virtues. And it would also be necessary to, to study the tendencies within liberal democracy that erode the virtues and erode their sustaining sources. In the meantime, it's reasonable to suppose that while American ex exceptionalism is indeed exceptional, America's exceptional embodiment of the idea of human freedom is not automatic and its perpetuation is not foreordained. Among other things, it depends on the cultivation of the virtues that support freedom. So it's reasonable to conclude that whether religious beliefs, practices, and institutions are among the beliefs, practices, and institutions that are necessary to cultivating the virtues that sustain freedom, it's necessary, it's reasonable to conclude that that is a question of exceptional interest. On the one hand, it implicates perennial philosophical issues. On the other hand, it's bound up with our most pressing practical concerns. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> We have now sort of staked out two very different accounts, um, and 
at a, at a minimum, I guess we can say that Paul Kahn is a glass half empty kind of guy, and Peter Berkowitz is a glass half full kind of guy. But I think that the, uh, the v divergence runs deeper than that. Um, our, our next uh, speaker will be Michelle Rosenfeld. Uh, Michelle is the Justice Sidney L. Robbins Professor of Human Rights here at the Cardozo Law School. Um, he is also, I should say, former director, co-director of the Florsheimer Center. He currently runs uh, Cardozo's program on global and comparative constitutional theory. Um, in his case, the JD is from Northwestern and the PhD in philosophy is from Columbia. Uh, Michelle has been at Cardozo since 1988, but during the, the years since, he's also uh, been taught at the New School, where he's an affiliated member of the faculty, visited at NYU Law School, and is a frequent guest lecturer at universities throughout Europe. Um, Michelle Rosenfeld, it's safe to say, is one of this nation's leading comparative constitutional law scholars. Uh, though he also writes about American constitutional law and jurisprudence. Uh, his most recent book is called The Identity of the Constitutional Subject and appeared about three months ago, I guess. Um, he is editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Constitutional Law and president of the International Association of Constitutional Law. Michelle. Thank you. Um, both of the previous speakers uh, looked at um, the issue from a macrocosmic uh, point of view, and, um, and my paper certainly fits in uh, the themes that they have raised, in particular the mention of the court and the constitution, but I'm gonna look at this from a microcosmic point of view, and uh, I'm gonna focus on a very specific uh, problem, uh, the conflict over citation to foreign authorities and I'm going to use as examples a very specific area, uh, the area of uh, dealing with the uh, criminalization of homosexual sex. Um, the, um, what this is going to show is that all sides in these controversies uh, are um, exceptionalists, uh, but uh, that there are currently two forms of exceptionalism on the court dealing with these issues. And one of them is, uh, I could summarize, it's U.S. versus the world. And uh, the other one is U.S. and the world, uh, except U.S. Uh, should aspire to be a little better. Uh, one is based on difference. The other one is based on converging values. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, the uh, controversies are well known, so I'm going to just mention um, them very uh, quickly in terms of uh, we're dealing also uh, this is why this uh, example taken from uh, the Supreme Court jurisprudence on homosexual rights is particularly telling. Uh, we're dealing with unenumerated rights uh, where the fundamental traditions of the American people are uh, important because the court in deciding whether or not a particular uh, practice or a condition within the privacy realm, whether or not it ought to be protected constitutionally, depends on whether it's so deeply embedded in the American tradition that it ought to be considered a right, even though it's not explicitly spelled out in the Constitution. So this is, gives us very rich uh, ground on which to look at these issues. Now, in the 1986 case of Bowers uh, v. Hardwick, the court five to four said that a statute that uh, Georgia statute that criminalized uh, homosexual sex among consenting adults was constitutional. And then in 2003, in Lawrence versus uh, Texas, the court said that a uh, Texas statute that criminalized such activity was unconstitutional by a six to three uh, margin. Now, the um, majority opinion in concurring opinion in uh, Bowers uh, reflect the dissenting opinions in uh, Lawrence and vice versa. The dissenting opinions in Bowers uh, reflect, uh, are reflected in the majority, of the, in the majority opinion in um, Lawrence. What is very interesting is the very radical, uh, dif radically different reaction in both cases, after both cases, to the citation to foreign authorities. And uh, so let me lay out what they are and then give you the reactions, and then try to explain why. Uh, in the um, Bowers decision, the one that most, uh, the most dealt with for citation to foreign authorities, 
was uh, Berger in his dissenting opinion. He pointed out that Judeo-Christian morals and Roman law, uh, as well as Blackstone's 18th century commentaries of the laws of England, um, work uh, clearly against uh, homosexuality. So it couldn't have been a, tr a fundamental tradition if all these sources were uh, so much against it. And he cited specifically uh, Blackstone saying that, that homosexuality is an infamous crime against nature of deeper malignity than rape. Uh, this, of course, in 1986, was, even in 1986, was extremely offensive to a lot of people. But uh, this is the, the, foreign, the main foreign citations in uh, Bowers. In uh, Lawrence, in 2003, Justice Kennedy wrote the um, majority opinion, and uh, he said, in part, to show that Berger's uh, references were both wrong and misleading, uh, that Western tradition had moved in the other direction. And for that, he cited a foreign authority, primarily a decision of the European Court of Human Rights, and a uh, law uh, that was passed by the British Parliament uh, which uh, made homosexuality legal. And uh, the Bowers, uh, the, uh, yes, the Bow in the Bowers case, uh, the reaction to the case, obviously, a five to four decision in, in particularly Berger's language was quite strong, but nobody focused on whether or not the sources he cited were foreign or American. On the other hand, the reaction in, uh, against Kennedy in uh, Lawrence was quite intense. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there was mention of starting impeachment proceedings against him for, for this. And on the other hand, uh, the, there was a uh, law project that was introduced in the Senate that would have counseled, um, most likely unconstitutional, of course, that would have counseled uh, justices not to cite foreign authorities when deciding constitutional cases. Now, the uh, dissent in um, Lawrence is also quite uh, striking, uh, and it was by Justice Scalia, uh, who um, said, of course, that it was wrong to uh, cite um, foreign authority, uh, who said uh, a very interesting uh, point about Bowers, saying that the Bowers majority never relied on values we share with a wider civilization. I guess by implication, Judeo-Christian morals and Roman law uh, have very little uh, to do with uh, the American legal system or moral system. But nonetheless, he, he said that. But uh, perhaps more interestingly, directly going to my point, uh, he said that these citations to foreign authorities by Kennedy were dangerous dicta. The, uh, the, law, the court should not impose foreign moods, fads, or fashions on Americans. So uh, these European positions were reduced to moods, fads, or fashions. And if you don't think this is strong enough, he was uh, quoting language in a case dealing with the death penalty, where uh, the European uh, uniform abolition of the death penalty is categorized as a mood, fad, or fashion. Uh, in any event, um, the, he also said that Judeo-Christian mores and Roman law are irrelevant, um, uh, makes it irrelevant. Uh, and so the question is, why this difference? Why no outcry, uh, no mention, although the case was itself very controversial in 1986, and why such an outcry in 2003? I will try to give at least an explanation for that. Uh, there are two big changes between 1986 and 2003 as far as this question is concerned. One is uh, the global spread uh, of constitutionalism with the fall of uh, the wall of Berlin and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, constitutional uh, law and the constitutional courts uh, spread uh, throughout uh, the, that region followed by the South African constitution, many South American constitutions. The, the shift, the global shift towards constitutionalism started really after World War II with Japan and, the, and Germany, but uh, then went to places like Spain, Greece, Portugal. Uh, but uh, there was a real explosion after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. So that's a change uh, because uh, the United States had uh, considered itself, and to, it wasn't entirely true, but it was uh, close to true, uh, that it was the uh, country that uh, lived by constitutional rule and that had a, a court 
that may, uh, rendered constitutional decisions and had a rich constitutional jurisprudence, whereas in the rest of the world uh, there was uh, no uh, equivalent. And therefore, American constitutional jurisprudence should be dominant. So this changed. Uh, now there are decisions from all over the world, and, uh, and, and many of them are uh, respected and cited in, in many countries other than the one where they're generated. The second um, is um, there is a, uh, the fact that this had, uh, obviously, uh, this is still part of the first uh, point I'm making, has an effect on national identity. We no longer have exclusivity in this area. Two, uh, there has been, uh, from uh, 1986 to uh, 2003, an exacerbation of long-standing uh, split in the United States concerning national identity. 1986 is still uh, the, the Cold War, uh, and we still see the world in terms of uh, two systems fighting, and of course the United States being on the right side, and it was proven to be on the right side. Uh, and uh, by 2003, the United States is the sole superpower in the world. But it's not only that, uh, it is that in 2003, it's the year of the Iraq uh, war, uh, and this war was uh, uh, extremely unpopular in Europe, or uh, specifically in old Europe, but uh, certainly uh, France and Germany uh, were opposed to this war. And the opposition to this war, which increased throughout Europe later, uh, even though, uh, for instance, Britain and Spain at the time were uh, participating with the United States in the war, a very high percentage of public opinion in those countries was against the war. So one can say intellectually, conceptually, uh, politically, within these countries, the war was not popular. And it was not popular, uh, many of the arguments were moral arguments against the United States, that it was a manifestation of America's uh, desire to grab power. I think uh, Paul Kahn mentioned uh, that uh, subject in his presentation. Uh, and therefore, um, that the Europeans started taking a moral superiority position with respect to that. Um, therefore, after this, um, I think that the uh, the, in the United States, there was greater sensitivity, uh, this is one explanation, uh, concerning referring uh, specifically to Europe uh, when dealing with something as uh, sensitive as uh, our most fundamental traditions, our national identity, and our constitutional identity, uh, as was the, what came up in, in, in Lawrence v. Texas. Now, uh, the views on the court itself in this setting uh, were also uh, two opposing views, and this is what I call the two opposing visions of uh, the American exceptionalism. The first is the exclusivist view, and uh, that's the view based on difference, uh, and a view espoused by, among others, Scalia, that the United States has a unique destiny, uh, exemplary value. Uh, it is a model for the rest of the world, but it is different than the rest of the world. The other view is the universalist view, and uh, there, uh, the universalist view is that uh, there are certain uh, fundamental values that, uh, uh, that are applicable throughout the world, and that in certain parts of the world, in certain constitutions, and certain constitutional decisions, and here we're thinking more about Europe and other Western countries, um, they, ha they are following them. In some respects, they may be more advanced than we are. In others, we may be more advanced, but there's nothing wrong with looking to them in order to perfect our universalist position. And for instance, for these people, uh, looking at what Europeans do with respect to certain human rights, including a more liberal position vis-a-vis -vis the rights of homosexuals, is uh, a way to improve the United States. Now, both of these views are, uh, are exceptionalist views in the sense that they both think that the United States should lead and set the example. The, the difference, though, is in one sense it should set the example by showing how different it is from the rest of the world, while in the other one is by being, uh, rather, by converging uh, with the rest of the world, but by doing it better than most other countries in, in the world. Um, so, uh, given this um, difference, um, the um, view of the European jurisprudence um, in by those who... Um, um, by those who cite it, uh, is, uh, at least the argument is, 
that uh, it is what is most enlightened and advanced in modern constitutionalism. So there's a recognition that with respect to some uh, issues at least, the, uh, let's say the most exemplary decisions, the ones to be followed, have shifted from the United States to Western Europe, and in this sense, uh, courts such as the European Court of Human Rights play an important role. Uh, and I, I should add, it's not only Europe, Canada, uh, South Africa, uh, are other countries that are mentioned quite often also because their courts have more progressive uh, decisions. So uh, the universalist camp is generally associated with progressives politically, whereas the uh, exclusivist camp is associated uh, generally, I say generally, there are exceptions of course, with uh, the uh, conservatives. Um, on the um, exclusivist side, it's not uh, enough, it was not enough to reject foreign authorities because they're foreign and therefore should be irrelevant in uh, focusing on Americans' fundamental traditions, which would, would be a, a point, uh, I think, of uh, great weight. But uh, also uh, the um, uh, strategy, and in, in the, the words that I cited of Scalia, I think, are a good example of this, is on the one hand uh, to challenge both the uniqueness and, and exemplarity of European jurisprudence and to trivialize its importance and aspirations uh, to universality. Uh, this is done two ways. As Scalia points out that uh, on certain issues such as homosexual rights and abortion and so forth, the European uh, jurisprudence may still be uh, a, a minority uh, because uh, it points out to countries in Asia and in Latin America, for instance, that have much more restrictive views on these issues. Uh, and then uh, he, his trivialization um, is uh, certainly manifest in those words that I use, fads and fashions, when dealing with such issues as uh, the death penalty. Um, now, uh, the uh, conclusion that I draw from this is that, uh, in, in fact, both visions are uh, visions of America's, uh, how America can play a role as a model for the world. One is by being more like other countries, meaning uh, the universalist view, doing better what other countries do, but when necessary, borrowing from them, uh, because uh, that, uh, that is a, an inclusivist view. The other one uh, by uh, we must uh, continue to uh, remain separate, otherwise we will lose our identity and won't be able to lead uh, the destiny. Now, the ultimate irony in all, in all this is that in both views, and I think that both of these views are complementary, they fit nicely in a dialectic uh, that uh, marks the uh, exceptionalism, uh, at least from the standpoint of constitutional uh, jurisprudence. Uh, what is ironic, ultimately, in this is that uh, what is most important to each of these positions uh, happens to be uh, the greatest obstacle for the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, those are the three principal papers, and uh, <clears throat> we are privileged to have with us two very distinguished historians uh, who will officially rise as, as commenters, uh, though maybe the boundaries aren't as clear as all that. Um, uh, first, we'll hear from Samuel Moyne. Uh, uh, Professor Moyne teaches at Columbia University, where he has been since 2001. Uh, his JD is from Harvard and his PhD from Berkeley. Um, he has a long list of, of prizes, uh, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, the Sybil Halpern Milton Memorial Book Prize from the German Studies uh, Association, and you should go to his website and be impressed. Um, and he also uh, has a reputation for being a, a, not just an extraordinary scholar, but a, a wonderful classroom teacher as well. Um, his work is primarily on modern European intellectual history, and in particular on the history of human rights. Um, and his most recent book, which is forthcoming from the Harvard University Press, is called The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History. Professor Moyne. Hi, well, thanks for having me. Uh, I have been asked just to comment on the first two uh, papers, and it's a real privilege to do so, as I was reminding Professor Berkowitz 
at a moment when I needed a respite from law school, I did audit one of his classes. Uh, and I, I've known Paul Kahn for years now. I'm going to try to be a commentator who facilitates. I want to uh, limit myself really to pointing out two, I think, substantial divergences between the two speakers that go beyond how full they see the glass. So Professor Berkowitz says that unlike Carl Schmitt, he thinks that religious sources aren't just a distant background to American exceptionalism, but it's key constituents. But actually, that was Schmitt's own argument when he addressed the United States in political theology, his famous book of 1922. In the third chapter, the one entitled Political Theology, Schmitt memorably cited Alexis de Tocqueville, who found that what made Americans distinctive was how fundamentally they allowed God's after effects to be felt, even as they switched, like everybody else, uh, uh, from divine to human sovereignty. So it was in comparison to Americans that Schmidt criticized Europeans for having forgotten the template in religion of their own political and legal order. Now it's here that I find the first, I think, most interesting and important divergence between Professors Berkowitz and Kahn. Berkowitz goes so far as to strongly imply that American exceptionalism departs from its continuing religious sources at its, our peril. But Kahn doesn't think that the Christian theological sources of American exceptionalism are so critical or at least suggest that putting too much emphasis on them uh, is bound to be misleading. True, Kahn cites Americans' exceptional, famously so, religiosity compared to other Western nations as evidence for the importance of the political theological optic. And Kahn insists that it's the Christian imagination rather than some other theological system that grounds American politics. But one might say that where Berkowitz is most interested in American religion, Kahn wants to focus on America as a religion. So these two analysts differ entirely then on the point of political theology. Now I don't mean to imply that he defends reactionary Catholicism. But Berkowitz, it turns out, is closer to Schmidt's most obvious goal. When it comes to America and in general, the point is to doubt how far modern politics really does, could, or should win independence from its true religious sources. In contrast, Kahn, though he follows Schmidt's emphasis on sovereignty, wants to offer an analysis of American politics in which the state is a kind of religion in its own right, whatever the historical lineage of the new faith. Most of all, the state claims are sacrificial commitments in what has to be seen as a heretical departure from Christianity, whose founders own self-immolation united humanity rather than allowed a nation to shine above others or go to war against them. So, in other words, it sounds like Peter and Paul need to talk about the meaning of Christianity, <laughs> or at least its relevance to American exceptionalism today. Professor Berkowitz has volunteered to insist that Christianity does and stood shall ma still matter as Christianity, while Professor Kahn either thinks that focus is uninteresting or wrong or both. Political theology is crucial not for recovering the basis of politics in faith, but in order to understand politics as its, as its own kind of faith. It allows for American life to be read as the sacred drama it really is, whether its participants profess the old religions or not. A lot of Americans may still go to church, but it matters more to Khan that they're part of the church of the state. Now I'll turn to this second divergence between these two uh, thinkers. If they diverge in describing the relationship between America and religion, they also do so about the political consequences of their findings. So in a long line from, say, Eusebius of Caesarea through Carl Schmitt's own followers, Catholics after 1933, Berkowitz wants to see a good fit between religion and perhaps it's now so-called Judeo-Christianity rather than Christianity alone, and, and his own regime, our regime. 
america's exceptionalism isn't just the belief of its citizens but a real distinction which it ultimately owes he strongly implies to the religious spirit if all those prior political theologians were wrong in thinking their nation's exceptional it's not because they made a bet on the embodiment of religion politically but because they made the wrong one they hadn't yet discovered america after two millennia of mistakes it's possible that berkowitz is right that you and i are, are just lucky to be living in the time and place in which religion along with human nature has found its successful political form or at least one such successful political form, since Berkowitz does say that there could be others. In contrast, Paul Kahn doesn't seem like a betting man. He simply wants to insist on the value of political theology for describing America, whether its self-understanding is true and good or false and bad. His point isn't as it was for Schmidt in his Catholic days, or it is as it is for Berkowitz now, to reclaim the religious basis of politics as a potentially indispensable resource. But it's also not to criticize American exceptionalism. It's just to see the way things are, and especially to restore to view what other approaches omit. The best theory avoids practical conclusions. Now, let me close by saying there's, of course, an alternative to Berkowitz's affirmative attitude towards an American exceptionalism rooted in religion on the one hand, and Kahn's studious neutrality as to whether America as a religion is worth our prayers. As an example, I'd like to cite Hannah Arendt, whose book On Revolution is an analysis of American exceptionalism. Uh, but she claimed that from the colonial days on, this exceptionalism always consisted in this country's break from political theology in the name of a truly secular politics. I believe she was actually uh, attacking Carl Schmitt, though, though she doesn't use his name in the book. Now, Hannah Arendt may have been wrong about the colonists and founders, and indeed uh, about the mainstream of American history so far. But she may have been right to insist that American exceptionalism, if it's defensible at all, need not find its roots in religion or even be like a religion forever. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll hear last from Hendrik Hartog. Uh, Professor Hartog uh, teaches history at Princeton University where he also directs the program in American Studies. Uh, he has a PhD in history from Brandeis and a JD from New York University. Uh, before going to Princeton, he taught at the law schools of both the University of Wisconsin and uh, Indiana University. Um, his work is very much on the, on the uh, social history of American law, um, include a, a much celebrated and well-received legal history of marriage called uh, Man and Wife in America, a History. Um, and, and in that, in, and in most of his work, he focuses on, on how what one might call the quotidian uh, legal disputes cast light on the larger and political and cultural themes uh, uh, in play at different historical periods, um, which is, in essence, what we're talking about here in the present. Professor Hartog. Thank you, and uh, thanks again to Suzanne Stone and everybody to, for inviting me. Um, I, I want to push a little harder on the notion of exceptionalism. When we talk about American exceptionalism, it's important to think uh, through why we use the term. Often, it is to deny the relevance of comparisons or to understate the transnationalism, the movement of ideas and institutions from elsewhere that has shaped our political culture. My colleague and friend Dan Rogers has made a career, notably in his magnificent Atlantic crossings, working to counter that understanding. Often the rhetoric of exceptionalism gets mobilized to decry or to celebrate and to justify our distinctive power in the world over the course of the 20th century and perhaps beyond. 
The idea of exceptionalism bears a complicated relationship to the notion of America as a beacon or model of liberty and self-government, and perhaps of democracy to the rest of the world. It may lead, as Paul Kahn writes, to a notion of sacrifice. Now, I want to stay away from all of that. Instead, I want to sketch three historical uses of the term, uses that I think can both be drawn out of our history and that might have shaped the more theological invocations and analyses. I, I'm going to do this as a movement in three registers, um, a quick just glance at political science, a longer look at political rhetoric, and then a short look at social history. OK, one. Um, and this is to return to Obama's so-called gaffe. Um, every nation is exceptional. This is the dirty secret at the heart of American exceptionalism. Um, the, the central reference here is, of course, Benedict Anderson's imagined community and his work on nationalism. Um, the notion of an imagined community is constructed in comparison always to a world of others, um, often colonial others or neighboring others. Nationalism is all about, that is the idea of the nation, is all about exceptionalism, about knowing that you are different than others. Um, I'll, I'll just give one anecdote about this. Um, I've been absorbed reading a genealogy of my own family, a family of Ju Dutch Jews, some of whom came here with World War II, some of whom died in camps, some of whom became Zionists and eventually moved to Israel. Reading their amazingly varied memories of the war, I was struck by their common sense of disappointment in their Dutchness. They had known Holland as exceptional, but with the Nazis, it had become something different, not exceptional, in fact, just another Germany. OK, that's enough on the political science. Within American political culture, to talk of being exceptional has usually been to talk about being an exception to something else. And I want to emphasize the something else rather than the exception. Um, much of the talk in American history, from the time of Winthrop's City of, on a Hill speech on the Arabella sailing to Massachusetts Bay, has been shaped by a sense less of the exceptional nature of America. In fact, Winthrop didn't have a clue where he was going than of the historical processes that America must be an exception to. An overwhelming something, that is what it has to be an exception to, is an overwhelming something that dominates malevolently the rest of the world. So for civic republicans at the time of the revolution, steeped in an early modern historicism, there were historical examples that revealed historical laws that an American nation or collection of states might or might not escape or transcend. Those laws described repetitively and obsessively the way virtuous republics moved in stages from austere innocence to luxury to decadence to corruption and to collapse. Um, Rome, Sweden, Poland, England were the sort of uh, typical references. The question was always whether and how that history might be transcended. And, Americans, and, and American size and potential wealth stood as challenges to that understanding. Now, the genius of the Federalists, at least in Gordon Wood's canonical rendition, was in their ability to reframe the question of Republican exceptionalism, to transform the question of being an exception from one that required adherence to a particular standard of virtue and restraint to one defined by the structure of governmental institutions, and one, at least in Hamilton and Madison's understanding, that insisted that the sovereignty of the people allowed one to step outside the framework of the pessimistic histories of previous republics. Now let me skip ahead to the late 19th century, to a question that lies behind much 20th century historical writing. That is, it's a forgotten question today. Why is there no socialism in America? Or more precisely posed, why is there no labor party in America? This is a question that can be posed both as a for it or a again it question. Marxist historians wrote about the American exception in, to in tones of regret 
as did some progressives. Conservatives and then consensus historians thought of American exceptionalism as a gift or an achievement. The consensus historians of the 1950s, particularly Louis Hartz and Daniel Boorstin, were among the first to talk explicitly about American exceptionalism. Many of them were former Marxists. In Hartz's case, the American exception was all about the absence of a feudal past. And all of them wrote in the shadow of the Second World War. And it's hard to remember this today. It's a forgotten past of this, uh, of this writing. But for them, the mark of the American exception was really less about um, liberalism than it was about the absence of a serious conservative tradition rooted in aristocracy. America was exceptional because it was liberal and pragmatic because of the absence of ideological commitments. The logic of modernity, read through the lens of the French Revolution and then the Russian Revolution, should in their rendition have led to a death struggle between aristocratic and radical understandings of the polity. America was different. It was an exception to what they implicitly understood as what should have been. So much, just to for, continue the example, so much of American follow, po foreign policy has, of course, been shaped by an exception to the logic of empire. From the Monroe Doctrine to the present, by way of the four freedoms and much else, including the language of George W. Bush. This is, I should emphasize, not the only aware way Americans talk, American foreign policy has been justified. Teddy Roosevelt talked differently, denied that America was an exception, thought that the responsibility of the American statesman was to come to terms with our status as an empire. But others, Woodrow Wilson, for example, retained the notion of, of exceptionalism as different from the rule. It's easy for many of us to sneer. I do all the time. And it's hard, at least for me, to read Wilson as he entered World War I or through the lens of Eric Weitz's wonderful new work on the relationship between Wilsonian self-determination and ethnic cleansing without a sense of creepiness. But I'm not here to justify, just to describe. Let me move on to, my, to the social history side of the story. What is American exceptionalism? And this connects to what Professor Berkowitz was, was talking about. Um, one reason, one answer is because it was an exceptionally attractive place. What makes and made, or let me ask it this question, what makes and made the United States such a magnetic draw to generations of peasants and ordinary peoples. So much history in the last, uh, historical writing in the last generation has been written as if the only ships coming to the country were slave ships or ships carrying coerced labor. But in fact, just to take a parenthesis on this, we know that America was not exceptional in its recognition and validation of chattel slavery. Indeed, one of the few exceptional things about our history of slavery was in the fact that in the end, after 1864, slavery ended for all, including for loyal slaveholders, not just for disloyal treasonous secessionists without compensation as a total expropriation of value. There's a wonderful article coming out on this in the AHR by American Historical Review by Amy Drew Stanley. But there's nothing much exceptional about our history as a place that recognized and profited from slavery. On the other hand, for millions of immigrants, America was an exceptional place. There are a host of reasons why, many more than I can suggest here, but here are four. One, many religious minorities, particularly those with a theological understanding of a world of fallen and hostile polities, saw in American constitutionalism not salvation or an exception to the secular dangers they recognized, but a form of protection, excuse me, not, not in salvation or an exception to the secular dangers they recognized, but a form of protection and security located in the free exercise clause of the Constitution. They found in America, in Robert Cover's lovely words, an axis around the which the wheel of history turned. Second, millions of others, at least fathers and parents, loved American property law. They loved testator's freedom. 
They loved the power that property promised to give them. Eventually, because of the exceptional mobility of American life, and because of the explosive and exceptional labor market that drew away their sons and daughters, they would learn that property was not enough to hold children in tow. But they learned quickly that they need not be bound by the communal lineages that defined and constrained property ownership where they came from. They found in America an exception to the constraints of lineage and dependency and control. For some, America may have been attractive because of notions of democracy and self-government. And for more, I suspect, once they got here, they discovered what democracy and self-government meant as an exceptional counter to their received understandings. So daughters stopped obeying parents, wives and husbands separated, servants walked away, control and authority became difficult. Four, more than anything else, of course, what made America attractive was wealth and available paid work and an excess of food. Not just a sufficiency, but an excess. This was not the only place where that occurred. Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, Canada, there are others. And we all will always have to remind ourselves that American wealth rested on the expropriation of native peoples and of slave labor. But one version of American exceptionalism is nothing but the happenstance that we had more when most others had less, when having less was the rule. As the conservative consensus historian David Potter once put it, we have been a people of plenty, which may also have made us an environmental disaster. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes, and we started five minutes late, so we'll run five minutes over, but I promise not longer than that, given the hour. Um, and I do want to take some questions from the audience, but first I did want to ask whether Peter and Paul have reactions to Samuel. Um, I, I think Sam had us about right. <laughs> uh, and I think we should just